Well, I really appreciate you uh, coming on and, and and doing this for me. I know you're you're a busy man, so um, I won't uh, I won't take up too much more of your evening here. Just um, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us about your journey with dogs. Sounds good. Thanks thanks for having me. By the way, and appreciate uh, appreciate the time. And I took it took a chance or uh, took a little time earlier and checked out your Instagram and your YouTube channel and um you're doing some good stuff so kudos to you um so for those of you don't who don't know me my name is andy segas i've um been raising american pit bull terriers since i was 16 years old so that's 30 years now um i'm also the owner of canine athletes which is a working dog brand uh, we sell collars and um, harnesses leashes treadmills apparel for humans that kind of thing and um, I'm also an ADBA judge um, since 2015. So um, I fly around the country and basically give my opinion on other people's dogs, <laughs> their confirmation and their temperament and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it's been a kind of a crazy, crazy ride. None of this has been planned. Um, all just stemmed out of the love for, for the breed. What was uh, What was your first connection with the American Pitbull Terrier and, and what was that thing that just said, oh, this is the breed for me? And Yeah. So, um, in high school, I was, um, 16 years old, or actually probably 14 at that point, my cousin was going to buy a Rottweiler. So me and my mom decided to go with her to help her pick out a puppy. And I ended up convincing my mom to take the brother home with her, <laughs> with us. So, um, so the Rottweiler was kind of my first introduction to dogs. I've always liked dogs. I've always liked nature, always liked um, just animals of all sorts. And then, but that dog, he kind of became my best friend and I, everywhere I went, he went. And um, from there kind of opened me up to meeting other people, um, like friends in high school had a dog and that kind of thing. And one of my buddies had a, um, a pit bull and i was like this dog's really cool right and then i started reading i wanted to learn more about the breed and i read the richard stratton book um from the 70s i think the truth about the american pit bull terrier and that was all it took now i needed to go get a pit bull so <laughs> i got my first one and no papers no registration just just a street bred little black pit bull and um she was super super cool um and that it just snowballed i've two years later i had 25 dogs in my mom's backyard it, it, it's crazy dude <laughs> oh wow that's crazy yeah. yeah and what was what was those early experiences is with with the breed and and that um kind of uh was a surprise to you and what was some of the things that you learned that um that, that people don't really understand yeah. Yeah. So, you know, back then there was no internet. I mean, it probably existed, but I didn't have access to it. Um, email definitely didn't exist. Um, so the only way to really learn is, I guess there were three ways. You could read a book, you could learn from someone else. If you had a mentor, if you had anybody who was experienced and willing to help teach you, or you could make mistakes and do it yourself and, and figure that, figure it out that way. So I kind of utilized the combination of the three, um, but I quickly found out that reading books really isn't the best way to learn. It is a lot of <laughs> a lot of stuff in the books that I read were didn't really apply, you know. And then um, there weren't too many people that I knew that were that I would consider experts on the breed. So I had to just kind of trial and error, just kind of learn on my own. And um, a lot of stuff you would read and hear about pit bulls were that they were mean, very human aggressive, dangerous dogs. And honestly, that wasn't my experience at all. They were actually the most friendly, the most tolerant to humans, at least the ones I had been around. Um, some were more dog aggressive than others. But um, I think at the end of the day, it really comes down to being a responsible owner and understanding what your dog's temperament is having a relationship with your dog, trusting your dog, and then keeping them out of trouble because any breed can get 
themselves into trouble, but the pit bull, the problem is that they're very strong. <laughs> and when they do get into trouble, they can do a lot of damage fast. But um, yeah, dude, like I, even to this day, I've never had a human aggressive dog that um, I had to worry about that anybody that came to my house had to worry about. So that was kind of like the biggest thing with the pit bull. I know they were on the cover of the sporting dog or the um, sports illustrated magazine with the T tank, you know, it's like, so that's kind of, that's kind of been the fight for the breed ever since was like fighting against that stigma of, um, you know, these are like killer, killer mean dogs that only thugs and bad people have. It's just not the truth. Yeah, so it was the combination of, I guess, probably everything. And then I don't know if you've read the Richard Stratton book, The Truth About the American mm -hmm. Pitbull Terrier, or if any of your listeners have. But if you read that book, um, it's almost like reading <laughs> the old Lassie books. Like he made the Pitbulls sound like these dogs. And I'm not going to say that he's he was lying. He might have exaggerated a few times in the book, but like, you know, like this was a breed that could do anything and could whip any other dog at anything as well. Like, you know, it could do everything any other dog could do and do it better. Um, not exactly the truth in all instances, but they really are a jack of all trades breed. And they're, they're, um, they're smart, they're fast, they're intelligent, they're, you know, strong. They, they're a great dog. And for me, it was just that combined with their temperament it really just kind of struck a chord with me and hit home and and um i mean everybody loves a, a gladiator right and this is this is this breed is a gladiator let's not lie i mean they were bred for combat that's where they were developed and um there's something admirable about that in my opinion yeah for sure uh could you kind of talk about the history and and what you've come to learn and, and yeah where where you think some of the the misconceptions are and, and all that yeah so you know as as i mentioned they're they're a combat breed they were developed for pit sports blood sports and um the breeders who were selecting you know the dogs that were used to originate the breed um you know they were using them for entertainment and to make money i mean and that's just a, the the truth of it, you can't deny it. If you're a student of the breed, you need to accept it. And then as you understand that, you can kind of understand why they are the way that they are today. And, and that's why the dogs aren't human aggressive. They can be if they're trained to be, you know, the dog always wants to be right. So if you're neglecting it, that's something, you know, but if you're teaching it to to bite people, then it's going to want, it wants to be right. It wants to please you. And it's going to do what you want it to do. At least try to most of them anyway. Um, but for the most part, these dogs are sweet. I've got dogs in the house. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're great. The problem that comes into, and this isn't just pit bull related. It's every breed is the humans involved. It's, you know, irresponsible people. Um, and that doesn't just, you know, it's it, it starts with the irresponsible owner making an irresponsible breeding and giving away or selling or not taking responsibility for for their breeding and and then it just kind of it's just a bad bad it, and it's affecting all the breeds not just the pit bull um it really comes down to the people involved and and you know that's why i don't sell dogs i've i i sold a few puppies in the old days long long time ago and i just i'm not interested in it um i only make a breeding when i need more dogs and i keep them and select the best ones to that earn the right to you know move forward in the gene pool other than that i'm not interested in uh dealing with the public because people lie <laughs> it's you, you can't trust them they'll say anything to get what they want and then once they get it, it's it's over. Yeah, and it's one of those breeds where it, it kind of it's probably hard to decipher sometimes. And yes, who's legit yeah. and who's not. 
Yeah, because and, and half the people, you know, some of them are probably good intention. It's just they're not prepared to deal with this type of dog. This is a, yeah. the, at least the type of dogs that I've I've been raising, you know, 30 years now, fine selecting my gene pool. These are serious dogs, man. My The canine athlete's mantra is serious dogs for serious people. And it, and it, and it really applies to the dogs in my backyard. I mean, they're not for the average person. I mean, some of them are sweeter than others, but I mean, they'll, they're going to test you <laughs> one way or another. You know what I mean? And it's like people just not everybody's cut out for the responsibility of a high drive working dog who, who, who needs, you know, if they don't get their exercise every day, if they don't have a, a way to, you know, get rid of that energy, they can become destructive. They can become quite frankly annoying, you know, and um, they just, and then, you know, a lot of the other people, they just, they just want the money. So they want my dog so they can breed them and make the money. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like it's like terrible they don't even care about the dogs they just want they just want the it's the ego stroke and to make a couple of dollars and that's to me it's it's not in the best interest of the breed the writ if people do stupid shit with the uh can i curse on you oh yeah yeah <laughs> okay people do stupid stupid shit with the dogs and um the dogs suffer and it's risky it's risky for me too because if they get in trouble fighting a dog or some stupid shit they're going to be like where'd you get the dog you know and they couldn't they follow the trail back to the breeder mm -hmm. and i don't need the trouble so um i just i learned long ago that half the time if i were to sell a puppy or give away a puppy i might as well just chop its head off before i gave it to the guy because it's either dead or it's neglected you know within, within a year like it's just not worth the trouble so I just breed less and keep what I breed and be responsible enough. I've got plenty of land, so it's not a problem. That's awesome. Can you talk about the history? What made a, a pit bull? This is something that I, I still don't quite understand. <laughs> I don't know, man. Honestly, I don't think anybody really knows for yeah. sure. You know, they talk about Mastiff bred with, you know, some small, small terriers, maybe – over in Ireland and stuff like that. But I'm not sure that anyone knows for certain what breeds were combined to um to to make the American Pibble Terrier, but seems seems like it would probably be something like that. Something you know, bigger mastiff crossed with a smaller, more nimble terrier. With uh, you know, the terriers are a little bit aggressive too. So you can definitely see the terrier in a lot of these dogs. Um but I don't know exactly for sure. I'd be lying if I if I tried to tell you. <laughs> Just being honest. It's probably like anything too. Uh, people came over and had their own little secret sauce, and it's probably yep. that's probably been going on forever. Where we, you know, I've heard yep. like people mixed, you know, other breeds and uh, in their own lines or whatever. Yeah, so when you're when you're breeding for performance, right, and your money's on the line, you'll breed whatever you want. You don't care about keeping the bloodline pure, right? You you just want something that can win. And that's another thing. Like these days, people get so caught up in these bloodlines, man, and to a point where it's it's doing the breed a disservice, and they're they're losing the essence of what the dogs are and their performance breed. They're a breed built for work. They need a job and and half these people, they only care about the names on the pedigree, man. And 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 if it if it's pure, if it's a pure whatever bloodline that is popular to them and, and, and they think is the, the greatest and they with no regard to. I mean, these dogs, I see them all over the world. These dogs look like they look terrible. They don't even look like pit bulls. They they don't have any of the qualities of what a pit bull is supposed to be but they're pure X, Y, Z bloodline, you know? And it's like, I just wish people would stop focusing on pedigree so much and focus on the merit of the individual dog more. What is the ideal pit bull to you? What, what does that look like? And what is, you know, describe that as best you can. And, you know, so like, Everybody should have their own standard as to how they're going to answer that question. I don't think there's one right or wrong answer because at the end of the day, it's your dog and you have to be happy with it. 
But for me, it's balanced. I want a dog that's balanced in, in every way. Mind, body, heart, um, physical, because that balance from an athletic standpoint is, you know, the perfect combination of speed and power. Um, in their mind, they're stable around people and, um, you know, can control their, their environment. But when it's time to work, there's a switch that goes off in their brain and they now they're focused only on their job. And um, I see it in my dogs, you know, they <laughs> it's like they go somewhere else when it's time to work. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, so I guess that's how that's how I would best answer it. I mean, and, and I also think they need to be tough. They need to be. I mean, remember, these dogs were built for combat. So people that tell you, oh, you shouldn't let your dog jump. You shouldn't. He's going to hurt himself when he lands. These, OK, maybe your dogs, but my dogs are built to be tough, durable, to take a beating and keep on ticking. You know, they're, they're, they should also be hardy. They should, you shouldn't have to take them to the vet every two weeks. You know what I mean? Like they should be, they should be tough. And these are not like, these are not Yorkshire Terriers that live in the house or, you know, what, whatever the Chihuahuas, these are, these are working dogs, man. And they're supposed to be able to handle punishment and, elements you know harsh elements durable dogs it's a it's a it's a, it's something that a lot of people are forgetting about working dogs in general they need to be durable because if if they break then they can't do their job you know what i mean does that make sense like even even your um you said you had some were, were they herders livestock guardian, I livestock mean, guardian. Right. Imagine, that rush, yeah. you got it. imagine being out in the in the in the mountains garden livestock and the dog, you know what I mean? Like the dog needs to be tough, durable, and hardy to do that job. And um, if he doesn't have those characteristics, he can't perform his job. So it's an important quality. I think a lot of people forget about. As for a, a modern use, what are some of the things that you harness that, 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 that combat energy that they, that, that the American people terriers have and, and yeah. know, what are some of the things that, that you found that has worked and what hasn't worked on that level? <laughs> yeah. So that's a tough thing because, you know, obviously what they're bred for, what their original purpose was, is now illegal. So what do you do um, to keep, to keep the, um, the traits that were, you know, tested for, for many generations prior and which developed the breed you know, there's dog shows, there's, there's sporting events. A lot of people do hog hunting with the dogs. Um, you know, it's not the same thing. It, it's, it's kind of probably similar to a lot of breeds whose original function um, is no longer relevant, right? Um, very few people are using their dogs for what they were designed for these days. It's just kind of the way that society has has gone um we don't i guess humans don't need dogs to work and perform um to survive anymore like they used to rely on them for um so you know i'm a judge for the american dog breeders association and they've got um not only confirmation shows but sporting dog events where it's called top dog so there's treadmill races there's wall climb events there's um lure coursing and stuff like that to kind of at least keep the dogs athletic without um you know i guess it's not the same thing but you got to keep them you got they need a job right so whatever you want to do with them is up to you but you need to keep them working one way or another whether it's exercise you know whatever you like to do with your dog but they need a job they they can't just sit around on the couch and get fat and and um you know what you breed you will see again and um i, I truly believe that statement so you need to make sure you're breeding dogs that meet your your standard whatever that is yeah like we just kind of so we've we do all kinds of things but um 
what I really look for in my dogs is I, I like a dog that's fast and strong and has a solid temperament in the mind, right? So um, when he works, he's focused. He's got good wind. He doesn't get tired easy. Um, and he never gives up, you know, whatever it is that we're doing. He's all in until I have to force him away from from the job. So, um, being that my brand is canine athletes, it's kind of it, it kind of stemmed from me liking athletic dogs and doing athletic things with my dogs. So, um, yeah, in terms of we go bike riding, I've got treadmills, spring pole, um, flirt poles, all different kinds of exercises to give the dog an outlet to exercise and and to just kind of be alive. Um, nothing worse than just leaving a dog in a kennel all day long, every day, or in a, on a chain um, to kind of just kind of drive themselves crazy. They need some sort of outlet. Um, and then the dog shows I've gotten into um, probably, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, going to the dog shows, meeting like-minded people, um, exercising the dogs with a purpose because at the dog shows um you want the dog to be conditioned so you can see their confirmation better and um so we really get the dogs in good shape for the dog shows and then when the athletic events started coming around um that was even better because it was more fun we get to actually compete competitively um with the dogs and of course you need to be in shape and and also it trains their mental because you have to teach them how to use the equipment and what you're asking them to do. So, yeah, you're right. Because the confirmation ring doesn't, it shows you, like you said, it, it kind of shows you what the dog should look like, but it doesn't show you anything or, or I won't say anything, but it shows you very little about how I can that dog take the tools that he's got from his structure and actually put it into into action and a lot of that comes from his brain you know and his heart and um you, you you can't so my my dog grand champion 10 lucho he's a top dog as well so that means he's earned his title in the sporting events very few i think there's only one other grand champion that's ever done that and only if you know only a handful of uh champions too like usually if the dog the dogs that can perform at the top dog events at a high level usually aren't the best from a structure standpoint and, and why is that because they should be right they should if they're built right they should be able to perform right but something's either the owner's not competing using the dog for that reason why i don't know maybe they don't want to take the time to teach the dog or maybe the dog just doesn't have what's inside in the brain or in the heart to actually compete at a high level. It's, it's kind of strange because you would think the best, the best confirmation dogs, the best structured dogs should be more efficient and be able to ex really excel at the sporting events. But so far it's not the case. It's either one or the other um, because it's not easy. And when you, it's a lot easier to stand in the confirmation ring and hold a leash, right? It's a little bit harder when you actually have to compete in, in, in an athletic event against other high performing dogs right and um you can you can blame the judge when you don't win in the confirmation ring but it's a little bit hard to blame the judge when your dog doesn't climb the wall as high as the other <laughs> as high as the other dog did so um, there's that can you talk about the official adba standards and, and how does that relate to what what you're trying to do on your yard yeah so the standard um is um it's based on you know the original function of the dog and how how some of the top performing pit dogs of the old days looked and um as i mentioned before it, it's a balance right you want to be um uh you want to be as fast as possible and as strong as possible without losing, you know, they say uh, too much of one thing robs you of another. So, you know, it's all about balance. You want balance angulation in the front and the rear. You want a square dog with good angulation. And, um, and that was because a dog 
when they were fighting back in the old days, um, a lot of the fighting match is wrestling and a dog that's more properly um, structured and um with good angulation and, and balance and leverage they utilize leverage in the wrestling um and and could breathe well because some of the short stocky dogs real strong early and then they tire out and the, the rangier dog with more balance was able to usually able to 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 beat a dog that was built not so good um so that's kind of what the standard was is is written on, and that's kind of like uh, a lot of the dogs that you see winning in the show ring are are, are built that way. Like my grand champion Lucho, he's he's totally balanced in every every way that you can. Uh, yeah, I don't think you can get much more balanced than him. He's so athletic and coordinated on his feet. He's like the gold standard, if you ask me, as to what a a, a modern day American pit bull should be. Um, in terms of looks, in terms of athleticism, in terms of temperament. Um, he's just one of those dogs that come around every 20, 30 years. Like I'll probably never have another one in my life. I've got some really good dogs, but to get one as good as him for, um, for the show ring and for the sports and just as my best friend, to be quite honest, he's on the couch right now. Um, it's just, you know, he, it was, the dog gods bless me with that dog. It's not, there's no other way to say it. I've been breeding dogs for a long time and I've been around a lot of dogs all over the world and he's just different. Can you talk about your experiences with um, the handling side and how that has helped you not only as, as a, a world-class ADBA judge, but a, as a breeder? Yeah, so handling a dog is a skill. Are you talking handling in the confirmation ring or just in general? All of the above, like creating good athlete to compete yeah. in the ring, and then just being yeah. a good, good. Yeah, so good so family member. Yeah, so and that's the thing, man. And I really think that's the edge that a lot of great dogs, um, that a lot of great dogs that don't ever you maximize their potential is because they're missing that bond with their handler. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of um, Hazel, the bully she's out and it's a dog out in California. It's a great story. Um, her owner, Alessa rescued her when she was four weeks old from like a puppy mill or something. This dog has turned in. She's um, they do bite work sports now, and this dog is awesome, dude. And it's like she wasn't bred for anything other than you know, I don't know, make a hundred dollars off of Craigslist or whatever, whatever the guy was selling for, like total accidental breeding or something. And this dog is like, she's um, she does IPO and PSA sports, like bite sports, and she's dude, she's like an internet superstar. I'll send you her. Uh, her Instagram later. You can check her Most out. Definitely. Most definitely. The, the the difference between her and all these other dogs from these super great bloodlines that um you know with these super experienced handlers that know everything. This girl didn't know anything. This dog didn't know anything. But you know what they had was the love for each other, that bond, a really strong bond. And that's the difference between um it'll take it'll take it'll make a good dog great you know a, a a poor dog good you know what i mean like it's a big difference and that and and you can't fake that you can't fake that the dog can smell bullshit dude like honestly you can try to fool people you can try to fool your dog but the dog's not gonna you're not gonna fool the dog you can fool people yeah you can fool people but the bond between a, a man or a woman and their dog if it's real and if it's strong that's a difference. It's a big difference. It's a big edge. So I think um, <clears throat> I see a lot of people, they just, they don't want to put the time in with the dog, especially when they've got a lot of them. And they just, they just want to get by, do the bare minimum. And then if the, if things don't work out the way that they're supposed to, or they hope they want to blame the dog where that's not fair. It's because you, the blame should always be on you. You, the dog can only do so much. You've got to put the dog in a situation to um, 
to excel and the dog will give you if the dog really believes in you and trusts you and you really believe and trust in the dog you know you can each give make up for where the other is lacking and you can you can do big things but i think uh i think bond is totally underrated and um you might not hear that from a lot of people i don't know but in my personal experience it can make a huge difference just being a bull breed lover and lifetime owner they have something different that i think a lot of people either don't know or understand or, or they take for granted like their connection with humans is so deeper than like my livestock guardian dog he really takes to me loves me looks at me as as the alpha but there's a point to that he's like oh, I'm my own man <laughs> back off a little bit sure you know? but with my bulldog is totally opposite he's gonna do whatever i want him to do because he wants to please me and that's the way i look at about american people terriers that just makes them yeah such a unique dog for man and i think that's why there is this like absolute loyalty and love for them because they they have the same absolute love and loyalty to their to their owners and unfortunately i think you know we can talk about the negative all day but i think that's the positive that a lot of people don't understand and they can harness some of that energy that we don't want them to have uh yeah by by doing what what you're doing and i you know that's kind of why i've really fascinated about about your your whole your whole brand and and you know what's going on in the in the show ring with the the, the adba which i think needs to be like highlighted more often yeah it's interesting what you had, uh, just to touch on what you said about your um livestock dog i mean thinking back that's probably they're probably that way because right they they needed to be um a little bit more independent right to do their job and they were out there protecting the livestock on their own a lot of times right Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. yeah so so i totally get it and it's interesting that you made that observation because it makes total sense like you mentioned about the the bull breed and how real they are and how you know the different type of relationship they have with man and and i agree with that and also like the unfortunate part is man takes advantage of it a little bit too often in a lot of instances and and the end result is a negative you know perception on the breed and it and especially the bull breeds in general they're just so misunderstood and it's it's a shame because honestly they're <laughs> to me they're the greatest breeds on earth really i mean i respect every working breed and um dog with a job it, it's they're all great in their own regard regard but the bull breeds for me i agree like they have a special place in my heart there's that famous quote that the man will always worship a born fighter, right? And I mean, it's no different with, with the dogs. I mean, everybody, pretty much everybody, I won't say everybody, but there's something cool about knowing walking your dog down the street and he can whip any other dog that pops out, even if it's three times its size, you know? And, and why is that? It's because it's inside here. That dog, even when he's losing, he thinks he's winning, you know what I mean? And it's not over till it's over. And, and I've seen all kinds of, like lab lab fights or different type of reason they call them fights they're not fights they're a bunch of barking and growling and the other one runs away it's a different story with these dogs man i've like i said i've been around 30 years with the breed firsthand multiple 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 dogs a year and accidents happen dog gets loose blah 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 whatever <laughs> these dogs are in their glory when they're in combat it's like your dog when it was chasing that rabbit i guarantee that dog was having the time of his life he loved you know what i'm saying um so it's still in the dogs for sure it's in and, and like you said things are different nowadays you've got to harness those instincts that are inside of them into positive ways and um so far the best ways are, are kind of like these uh these sporting events and you know, some of these guys doing the hog hunting with them. I'm sure 
the dogs are having a blast doing that and they're providing a service because I guess the hogs are really invasive in the South and stuff like that. But I mean, honestly, I know some people that do some, I mean, not that pit bulls can smell very well, but they use them for, you know, tracking deer and different sorts of things like that. Um, they're really all around. If, if, if you teach them, I mean, they're even doing bite sports and they're doing, doing pretty well there too, you know? So like, They'll do whatever whatever you ask of them, and that's kind of what's so great about the breed is really well well rounded and kind of like a jack of all trades. They can really kind of do a little bit of everything and and do it pretty good. It's kind of cool to when you can beat some of the other breeds in their own game. So I think with the right handlers, they really get a you know little extra motivation by by winning with with a, a bull breed in in those arenas. So it's kind of cool too. at the risk of getting into the minutia, but it's just kind of way my brain brain works. And some <laughs> of the people that listen to me, I know we kind of touched upon a little bit, but when you're breeding for a dog and when you're going to put it in the show ring and then when you're going to compete with it, yeah, what are the standards that you're looking for? I'm talking height, weight, structure, paint us a picture with your words. Yeah, so to me, my ideal American Pit Bull Terrier is a dog that's probably about, I don't know, 40, 40, between 40 and 45 pounds, um, nice and square, um, three-dimensional. So not just looking good from the side, but when I look at it in the front, I want to see some, I want to see some um, width of the shoulders, right? I want to see some thicker bones in the front, durable um, I want to see a dog that looks like he can take what he can give, right? Nice, strong neck, big head. Um, not too big to slow him down, but big enough where, uh, you know, a lot of these dogs today I see in the show rings and their heads are too fine. They're too, they're not, they just, they just don't look, uh, strong, I guess for a better lack of the word. But, um, and then I also want to see a dog that's confident, right? I don't want to see a dog with his tail between his legs or kind of nervous looking around. And I don't particularly like a dog that's um, uninterested in what's going on either. Some dogs are kind of like just super, super mellow. I want a dog that's, you know, especially when he's out in public, he's ready and he's ripping and ready to go. Like, what a, you know, just waiting for the, the green light to do something. And you, you can feel that energy and you can see it in their eyes. So that's kind of my, my perfect, uh, my perfect ideal pit bull. Um, and then, and then also a dog that not only me, but you or a little kid can come up and pet at any time. You don't have to worry about any redirection or anything like that. A dog that's smart enough to know what his job is and what his job isn't and not going to accidentally bite you out of, uh, you know, pent up a, a motion or stress from the, the environment. So they need to be temperamentally sound as well. Yeah, absolutely. Could you uh, talk about your experiences breeding and, and what, what, what it's like to to breed an american pitbull terrier and how are they uh, uh, in the whelping process and all that yeah man um so they're <laughs> they're tough to breed um in my opinion they don't like to breed um well the males like to breed more than my females but yeah it's very difficult to get two dogs bred naturally at least on my yard um luckily we've got the benefit of artificial insemination nowadays so you can easily take a lot of the the struggle out of in the old days they used to have to have a f two friends holding the female one in the front one in the back and trying to help the male you know it was just then they're tied and the, the female's pissed off and it's just it's just not a fun situation i really don't like breeding dogs um <laughs> but ai has made it a lot easier because now you can just collect the mail and um, gotten pretty good at artificially inseminating on my own. But if you're not, you can just go to the vet and pay a little bit of money and they can take care of that for you. 
highly recommend progesterone testing versus counting days as well because i've noticed a lot of uh counting days works in some instances a lot of instances but you can miss some key breedings some females ovulate later you know so it's like save a lot of time and frustration if you just spend the money and do the progesterone testing then ai i'm on the day that the day that the vet tells you in two days if you if you really want to you know increase your chances um my my dogs as mothers um you know there's some and and i know some people longtime breeders who have females who have big litters and they're great moms but mine have never been quite the best moms <laughs> they require a lot of uh lot of hand holding and um can't let them out of your sight type thing i actually had one female jump out of the second story window while she was on puppies in my bedroom I was walking a dog past the the window. Um, she was upstairs with the pups. I just wanted to let the dog out quick. And I was walking them past the window and she seen the dog and hopped straight through the screen, two stories down, bam, chased wow. a May, yeah, like nuts. So yeah, so <laughs> my dogs are not the best, best mothers, but a lot of pit bulls are, a lot of them are, it's just, I don't know. I guess the little strain that I've gotten a little bit extra crazy, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so the first few weeks are rough. I don't sleep much. I keep them in, in my bedroom, literally, and mm -hmm. uh, get them to a point where they're they're not going to die because you could lose a lot of puppies and a lot of puppies die. Not under my hands, but a lot of people, it's kind of natural. That, oh, I lost a couple puppies. I lost a couple. Yeah, but that's because you just left them alone and didn't do your your part. You know, they probably wouldn't have died if they were in my bedroom with me. Because <laughs> as soon as I hear something, I'm up. You know, and it only lasts a few weeks, and then they're good. Then they're good. So, for me, for me, diet is is key. It's the single best thing I've done um, for my dog's health is um to switch from from kibble to raw um so probably this was probably i don't know 2000 maybe 2012 or 13 somewhere around there i had two dogs die and one almost die from a bad batch of kibble i used to buy kibble by the pallets and um two dogs died and one got really sick almost died and um it was from the kibble it was contaminated it was uh diamond dog food so that was enough for me because i had always heard about feeding raw and you know you're a little nervous you don't want to change you, you're used to doing what you're doing you don't know if you're going to feed raw right if it's going to be balanced this that people like to scare people when it comes to feeding raw it's got to be perfectly balanced it's got to so it always kind of held me back i used to do a mix here and there sometimes but for the most part I just fed kibble but when those dogs died that was enough motivation to really just try i said what's the worst that's going to happen i'll go back to feeding kibble if this doesn't work right and um yeah i've never looked back man it's it's the longevity um you know the dogs the dogs when they're young whether you're feeding them kibble or raw i mean a young healthy strong dog is going to it's tough to tell the difference in the in the early stages, but as the age is where you really see it, the longevity. I mean, my dog Lucho is 11 and a half right now, and he is, I mean, he can still do everything he used to do when he was six. Like he's, and it's the diet. It's really, I swear by it, it's a diet. And um, so that that to me is, is feeding a, it, and, and don't, don't, if you're scared to start feeding raw, think of it like this like as humans right we we don't really worry about eating a balanced meal every day we just kind of eat and eat some of the more variety that you eat and 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 you're good like some fruits some vegetables some meats and um try to stay away from junk food and that kind of thing and, and you're in pretty good shape right so it's the same thing with the dog so like i i try not to scare people off i just want them to to try feeding raw and and don't overcomplicate it and i've got some diets on my uh, i've got a uh, on my uh, my blog on the website so it kind of outlines 
my journey into feeding raw and what I feed and, um, and, and there's, there's a, there's a regular diet and then one when you're kind of getting them in shape to kind of supercharge it, but it really comes down to just, you know, lean meats and, um, oils and egg and just don't overcomplicate it. If you only have chicken this week, feed them chicken. If you've got access to venison, feed them venison. Be, you know, mix it up. The variety is good. And, um, and, and just try and see. And if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. You'll get better. That's how you learn. So I think feeding a, a raw diet is critical, not only for the American pit bull terrier, but for any, any canine. If you're rich. If you're rich, you can feed the pre-made stuff. It's really good. I, I only feed that to Lucho now. Um, just because, um, he's been on it for so long, but yeah, it's pricey, but man, is it, it's, it's, it's super good. It's called instinct by, um, it's, uh, they used to be nature's variety. They've rebranded to instinct. Uh, they changed their name instinct by nature's variety. I think they might they're somewhere out West. I don't know if they're in Missouri or Kansas or something like that, but it's frozen. It looks like beef patties. And I, that's yeah. what I use to welt my pups, yeah. too. I can't say enough good things about it. It's just the price is crazy. And it's not like – it's not feasible if you're feeding a yard of dogs, for sure, like a kennel. Like, I wish they would sell it in bulk quantities for, like, kennels or something. But they don't. <laughs> so I can't afford to feed it to them all. The rest I just feed um, homemade raw, which is still great. Their dogs live a long time on it. Then I feed, you know, I switch it up during the hunting seasons. They get a lot of venison, that kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, check out if you or any anybody listening can check out the the blog on my website. And if you have any questions on it, feel free to reach out to me because I'd love to help. It. I'm not an expert by any means, but like I didn't go to school for nutrition, canine nutrition or anything, but I've got experience doing it, and the results seem to be pretty good. Yeah, it's good to know. I'm definitely going to check that out. So now let's talk about the brand, Canine Athletes. How did that come about? And and uh, tell us about this journey because that's how I, you know, I came to know know about okay. you and your and your brand. And yeah, and, uh, yeah. So it, it basically it's like um, it's one of those crazy stories where so. I just kind of followed my passion, right? And that's dogs. And where does that lead you? I don't know if you've ever heard the, um, if you've ever listened to the, the commencement speech by Steve Jobs, it's, it's super popular, but um, you know, where he says you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking back. So like looking back now, I kind of, it's kind of all makes sense. But at the time it didn't make any sense. Like I just, um, I just, made an, a Facebook page in like 2010 called canine athletes. Right. Just cause I thought that embodied not only my breed, but any athletic dog, any dog with a job it, or, or not a job, any, any dog that like just a normal house pet, but what the, the owner wants to live an active lifestyle with. I thought it was cool. So I, I made a page called canine athletes and it was at the time it was, the goal was just to kind of, build like a little community and talk with people about different aspects of, you know, nutrition, health, exercise, that kind of thing with all kinds of breeds. And I thought the benefit of it at that point was for me, it'll keep me sharp because it'll give me a reason to do more research on topics that maybe I wouldn't research as much. So that's kind of where it started. And um, a few, a few after a few years of of doing that, like um, you know, me and some of my buddies were starting to go to the dog shows a little more frequently, the confirmation shows, and um, I had no plans to try to monetize this or anything. But my friend asked me to make a couple T-shirts, so we had some T-shirts with that said "Canine Athletes," you know, and um, at the show, so we kind of just kind of like had a little team or whatever. Like, I don't know why, why he wanted t-shirts, but I thought it was cool too. So I, um, that was my buddy. He made me a logo and I, and I needed to buy 24 shirts or else the shirts were going to cost like $50 each to make two shirts. So I'm like, what the hell am I going to do with 24 of these shirts? 
um well let's see if anybody wants to buy some so i put them for sale on facebook and they sold out you know after like a few days i was like wow that's super cool then people want a different color so it all kind of snowballed from there like i had a good job making six figures um and um like i never really had any plans to turn this into a career or even a business but um as time progressed like i just kept going with it and seeing where like where is this gonna go what happens if i do this what happens if i do that and um like you know i think the problem with a lot of people because i've seen so many brands or you know the cool thing about the internet is like it kind of kind of um the barriers to entry are are low so like anybody can start selling stuff or, or pretend to be a company, or pretend to be a brand, but they don't last. And why is that? Because they're looking for the quick, you know, they're only in it for the money and they're looking for the quick, uh, get rich quick type of thing. But the fast way is the slow way because the slow way is the only way, if that makes sense. So like things, things don't happen overnight, right? And if your heart's not in it, you're just going to quit when you, when you, when, when the money's not there. But if you really like what you're doing, you really believe in what you're doing, you're going to make it work. Cause you're not going to give up. You're just going to keep going. <laughs> so that's kind of what happened, man. Like I, I, I was, this company was doing hundreds of thousands of dollars while I was still working 50 hours a week at a corporate job. You know, so guess what I was doing when I wasn't working my corporate job I was doing this. <laughs> I wasn't watching TV or Netflix or any of the stuff that normal people do, but I was doing it because I liked it, you know, and it was, and it was fun. And it was, you know, there's something, something rewarding about building a brand from scratch and, and just seeing where it goes. And now, you know, it's literally paying all my bills. It's feeding all my dogs. And it's like, it's just been a wild journey and so like I, I i still have no idea where it's gonna be in five years or even next year but it's a it's been a fun ride and i'm glad that i've um done what i've done and, and i i had the guts to quit my safe job you know and um and try this because i think i would have definitely regretted it if i didn't um so uh my advice to people out there who who want to do something is to take the risk because you're never going to know what the alternative is anyway so you might as well try yeah and that that you know i could have grew it faster maybe if i if i took more risk and quit my normal job earlier but it all worked out the way it was supposed to work out in the end i think and um but dude, like my advice to you is you're not that old yet, man. You can still do whatever you want to do. You're going to live another 50 years. So keep doing what you're doing. If there's something you want to do, try it. Um, you know, balance the risk. Obviously, you're in a position probably now where you're a little bit older. You've got a wife you got to think about and that kind of thing. But um, you're never too old, man. I definitely don't think think anybody's too old to try, try doing something following their heart yeah and that's that's the thing it's called being an operator right like and and trying different things and not being afraid to try something and not getting uh frustrated when it doesn't work and um and quitting you just gotta keep going and that's the best way to to learn i mean all these guys online trying to sell you get rich quick schemes and all this stuff it's just not the way man you got to put in the work at night when you're tired and you'd rather turn on net netflix and watch some comedy or something or you could get on the computer and google how to make my podcast bigger you know what <laughs> hey, hey, what are you gonna do eat some ice cream and watch watch netflix or are you gonna try to try to figure some try to figure it out how to get to where you know what i mean so you're only going to do it as if you really want to do it. Nobody's going to be able to force you into doing it. You got to, it's got to have, you got to have that discipline and not everybody has it. And, and that's okay. Well, you know, testament to you now it's, you know, this is taking you around the world. Dude, it's crazy. And, um, 
you know, it was part of the brand and most of the, most of the, um, cr the credit should go to that dog Lucho that I was talking to you about. He's on my shirt. He's the logo of the brand. Um, he, he, he's the one that put the spotlight on me. Not saying I deserved it or didn't deserve it. It's just kind of the way it worked. He got popular and in turn, I got popular and got asked to start judging. And, and then I, you know, but at the same time, I seize that opportunity and really go above and beyond for all the clubs I judge for. And there's a reason I was most requested judge a few times. And I've been the most internationally requested judge since I started judging. There's a reason for it, and it's because I'm good at what I do, um, and I really my heart's really in it. So I'm not looking for a free flight to a different country. Yeah, it's cool, but I can afford my own flights. You know what I mean? I'm really going there to do do what's best and to give back to the American Pit Bull Terrier. Um, it's a breed that's given me time. I've dedicated my life to it, right? Um, I'm not married. I don't have any kids. I live for these dogs. and um, it's it's my duty, I think, to to do what I can to to give back to the breed. Mm -hmm. Talk about your experiences. A couple more questions, on it. but uh, can, can you talk about uh, your experiences judging and and um, how has that helped you with your own program and your in your business? Yeah, it's definitely helped with the business from a marketing perspective because um, it's just it's just given more eyeballs it's more awareness to the brand right so that's definitely been um a benefit um and not only in the united states but worldwide like literally any show you go to across the world there'll be people wearing my brand it's pretty cool it's pretty cool because it's it's a tight-knit group of people with like-minded people who just love not only American pit bull terrier, it's a, all different breeds. You know, they they can relate to it. It's a lifestyle that they live, and it's a brand that kind of caters to that and and understands that. Um, in terms of going to shows, it hasn't really impacted my dogs per se. In terms of, I I will never breed my dogs based on the confirmation standard written by the American Dog Breeders Association or any other any other confirmation standard, right? I breed to my standard because at the end of the day, I'm the one that's got to take care of these dogs and be happy with them. So that's that's one of the downsides of the, the dog shows, I think, is that some of the competitors take it a little too serious and place their dog's worth based on did they win a ribbon in the dog show today. And the dogs are so much more than that, especially a working breed. Like, <laughs> and let's be honest, at, at the end of the day, not all judges are created equal. And there's so many variables of showing dogs that you're not going to win every time. Even my dog didn't win every time. Plenty of times we walk out of there with with no no ribbon, no trophy. And do you think I thought less of him afterwards? No way. No way, you know? So, um. That my advice to anybody breeding dogs is to sure understand the standard and but you need a goal first. And what is your goal? Is your goal to breed the best American Pitbull Terrier? Is your goal to breed the the dog that can win the most ribbons? Because those are two different goals and those are two different types of dogs that you need to try to breed for, uh, you know, try to get to. So um, to me, a working breed should never be bred based on looks. Like you keep it in mind, structure does play a part in athleticism and stuff, but what truly matters in a working breed is what's inside of them and can they do the job that they were bred for. So keep that in mind, everybody. Like these shows, keep it in perspective. It's a time to have fun, do something social with your dogs, but it's not worth getting upset or thinking your dog is useless because it can't win at a dog show. Um their working breed if they can if they can work then that's what really matters at the end of the day this might be a, a slightly con con controversial question and if you don't want to answer that's okay um what part of the world besides the united states are breeding what you consider really good american pit bull terriers yeah um <clears throat> 
So there's some nice dogs in Poland, really nice dogs. Um, American Pitbull Terriers, there's a lot of them. It's a lot of good dogs in Mexico, in the Balkans, and Serbia, Russia, you know, <laughs> kind of where the, the laws against dog fighting and that kind of thing are lax. Um, so these guys are able to, I guess, test their dogs in a way that a lot of people in um, the Western society aren't. I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing, but when you're talking about breed origin and um, keeping the dogs true to what they were originally designed for, um, some of those breeders have some of the um, abilities to take things to a different level than you know, a lot of people in, in the United States, for example, as far as show dogs and stuff like that. Um, I just got back from judging in Brazil and wow, are those guys doing some good stuff down there? Um, Del Monto kennels, um, have really revolutionized the dog show world for the American people terriers in Brazil, They're breeding some beautiful dogs that are really good at top dog, the athletic events and also in the show ring. And that's really what they're focused on. Um, and they've, they've, they've made big strides in a short amount of time. And, um, I, I definitely recommend them to anyone in South America. I mean, they ship all over the world though. Um, they're honest people. You can trust them. Then you, you, if they tell you something, they're going to do it. And they're always trying to do what's in the best interest of the dog. Um, anybody that sells a lot of dogs kind of get hate from people say they they're all in it for the money and they're puppy peddlers but that's not the case with them i've seen it firsthand they invest a lot of money into their operation and um uh they do a lot of things that go under the radar that people don't even know about in terms of um uh, you know placing dogs with the right people with no financial um you know means coming back to them it's um they're they're doing good stuff so, yeah, I'd say Eastern Europe, Mexico, some of the stronger, stronger. If you're looking for the heritage, true American pit bull terriers that really uh, embody the old school mentality, those guys have a little bit of an edge, I'd say, because of just kind of where they're located. I don't know. You know, it's hard to say. I think I think there's definitely a lot of room for oppor a lot of opportunity for growth. Um there's a lot of untapped markets um, or niches that I could that I see the brand, um, you know, would 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 fit in terms of like so like hunting dogs for instance. The brand's perfect for that. Um, we just haven't touched that niche yet. Same with just like I think a lot of um, a lot of normal pet owners don't understand the the brand in terms of uh, they think canine athletes they think it's too it's it's only for working dogs it's too hardcore for their their pet dog that lives on the couch and that's not really the case it's anybody that wants quality equipment um and live an active lifestyle with their dogs can can use this stuff you know it's stuff that's going to last it's strong it's um it's built right and um you can trust it so i need to i need to from a marketing perspective, get that point across to just some of the normal pet owners as well, who, who, who have an active dog, who like to go hiking with the dog and, but not necessarily compete. The brand works for, for those people too. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of my, my big picture goal and, um, just kind of just expanding the product assortment and, um, my, my market reach. To, to to new niches like you know like the hunting breeds and the, the normal pet owners who just want quality equipment give some love to the livestock guardian dogs yeah that stuff too that yeah. stuff too i need to get some collars with bells on it or something <laughs> big spikes yeah. yeah yeah i mean that's a good idea i've had i've had a guy uh he he actually ordered one of my collars he's got a guard a livestock guardian dog down in florida it looks like a uh forgot the name of the breed i think it starts with an m kind of looks like a uh mountain dog like an abruzzi mountain dog but it's got a different name um but he said he needed a collar with spikes on it too <laughs> so 
definitely room for opportunity for growth there. Yeah, awesome. What would be the second breed? Yeah, that's a tough question, man. Because for me, honestly, I've never, like when I got my first pit bull, I've never wanted another breed. <laughs> I've never wanted one. Um, so that's kind of, it's a hard question. I don't know, man. Like, I don't, there's so many cool breeds out there that I respect and like, but to me, I just, I just, I I could never see myself ever owning a different breed because that means for me that I'd have to own, <laughs> that's one more pit bull that I could have owned, <laughs> but instead I've got this dog. So I, I've asked myself that question. It's just hard to pin down because I, I respect so many, so many breeds. There's a lot of breeds I definitely could say I wouldn't want. And just for the, just like the Belgian Malinois, great breed. I don't want anything to do with those dogs. <laughs> it's just yeah. my perspective. Like it's that kind of dog and me are not going to work out. Um, but I don't know. It'd probably be, it'd be definitely be a working dog. Like I really liked my Rottweiler um, that I had when I was a kid. So I, I have a, a, a fiction to those, those dogs, but I'm not sure that I'd want another one. Um, honestly, you know, when I was in Italy, I really liked those Abruzzi mountain dogs. Um, and they live wild, man. They live wild on their own or all over. And they're tough. And they're hardy dogs, you know. Um, they got a mean streak to them, too. So they'd be kind of cool if I needed something for protection work, I think. Whatever breed it would be, it would be a, it would be a working breed, a real, true working dog, you know. I might go to the mountains in Italy and just grab one. And take it because I know that dog, you know, from who cares what bloodline, like just wild. That's a dog for me. Like, I want a real dog that's, uh, you know, I don't care so much about purebred or pedigree or anything like that. Like, I've seen a lot of mutts. I was in, I was in Brazil on the beach and I ran into a mixed breed pit bull, I guess it was. I don't know. He was cool, man. That dog was badass. He was living, living free. You know, the, no idea where he's getting his next meal, but he didn't care. He was happy. And that's a tough dog right there. That's my kind of dog. No, I think that should do it. I really appreciate the time, you know, and just, you know, if I could leave with one one last thing, I just remind everybody. And this is what I try to remind everybody when I'm at dog shows is to keep the working breeds working. Like, like you mentioned about the Pyrenees, there's nothing worse than a strong working breed of dogs that get watered down and they turn them into to something that they're not. And, and I see it at the dog shows too. A lot of these American pit bull terriers with American pit bull terrier papers, they're more or less am staffs. They're, um, they're a different breed, man. And it's because of the breeder behind them and what they're choosing to breed. The selection is either not there or it's poor. Um, so just uh, do the do the working breeds a favor and keep them working. Give them a job, and and um, when you're making a breeding, there should be selection. There shouldn't just be my friend has a dog. It's it's easy. Let's and it's and it's got papers. Let's breed them. Every dog mm -hmm. should earn their right to be bred, and um, and that's where you find the good dogs. Is find the good dog men. You'll find the good dogs. Absolutely. 